Well, a big hello to Eric from here in the UK. Eric, how are you? I'm doing well. It's so nice to see your face again. It's been far too long. It, well, I was trying to remember when the last time, actually it wasn't that long ago. It seems a long time, but it was only the season before last in Leipzig. In Leipzig, yes. Yeah, and uh, we we were there not in any singing capacity. Well, actually, you were singing a little bit. Well, they, they coerced me at the last minute to come up and sing with my, my former colleagues. So yeah, I managed well, to do a, a short set with them. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, okay, so I'm here in the Forest of Dean um, on the Welsh <laughs> border. Um, it's, it's dreary evening here. Um, it's a typical late October, early November it's kind of raining sidewards as it does here yes. and you're, it's looking pretty gloomy um, and your early morning California. Uh, actually, it's just coming up upon noon right now. So yeah. yes, the, the weather here is markedly better than it was uh, a short while ago. Um, uh, for those who might not know, California has been experiencing some rather unusual, well, not unusual anymore, um, unfortunate weather, uh, dry, uh, hot, windy and the the fires have been basically plaguing us for two months so air quality is down again yeah. today and yeah. yeah there's all sorts of strange things in the world i mean we we, we see the news we we see the pictures and uh, it's in a year that everything else is hitting us that's the last thing you need over there oh i know my, my daughter had uh, her birthday on the 9th of september and we woke up to a dark orange sky <laughs> that never Gosh. got better. It looked uh, sort of apocalyptic. It was, it's yeah. been very, very strange. I saw, I saw footage from the Golden Gate Bridge just looking yeah. like I've, I've never seen anything really over there. Yeah. Eric, um, you, you, you have probably one of the most instantly recognizable faces um, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, aided by several hair appendages um, yes. You are probably the most in, instantly recognizable a cappella singer, if not singer, ever. <laughs> um, and and I, I can't remember a time when you didn't have your wonderful handlebars. It actually predates Chanticleer. It was a, as I like to say, it was a poor choice in college that never went away. A poor choice. Well, a fantastic <laughs> choice because it's, it's, it makes you instantly recognizable. Um, Eric, tell us, a, tell us, uh, a little bit about pre pre Chanticleer. I mean, you you joined the group in 1990. Yes, and uh, August you did 20th, a, 1990. <laughs> and you did uh, what, 28 seasons. So I mean, basically years. three three decades of touring, and um, yes. which is a, a, an amazing feat. What what was the Eric pre 1990? Tell us about your musical childhood oh, background. Well. I grew up in a family that wasn't especially musical, um, but there were a few key figures that sort of inspired and guided uh, my whole family's path. My brother um, and sisters went through the high school program here uh, well, down in Southern California. And we had a fantastic choir director named Bill Dunton, um, who more than sort of giving just sort of theory and, and basic knowledge of, of music, he inspired the kids to sort of participate and to learn and to really enjoy what they were doing. So I was able to go through that program as well. My brother actually, uh, who was older than I, went through the music program at UCLA and thought about performing, but really ended up as a teacher and then an administrator. Um, but I had this wonderful example of people studying music. You know, my brother would move all of his things back into the house for a short time while he was looking for new housing in college. And I would go through his listening library of things he was studying in college, all the classical music. And at about the age of 13, I was sort of hooked. So, you know, as I like to say, I wasn't into popular music. I was into the more unpopular music of the time. Um, but it just enthralled me. And I, I had to find a path to pursue that. Um, now, add to that, that at the age of 14, I essentially had this voice, which was a bit... Um, disconcerting to some and very pleasing to my choir director, people started nudging me in the right path to, to sort of pursue singing a bit more seriously. Um, and then I went to the university, first in Southern California, and then transferred up to San Francisco to have a better musical experience outside of the university setting. 
Mm -hmm. um, during that time, I sang with the San Francisco Symphony Chorus and, you know, wonderful major orchestra doing great repertoire, um, made three recordings with them while I was still in college. And it turned out that the assistant director of the chorus for that group was a founding member of Chanticleer. So oh. during every audition, I would come in, do my little bit. And the first year it was, well, you know, when you finish your degree and you have lots of experience and you feel you're at the top of your game, you might consider trying out for this wonderful group called Chanticleer. It's like, oh, that's wonderful information. Thank you. I'll tuck that away for later. And the second year as well, yes, you know, you probably finished degree, but I, I think this is a good path for you. And then the third year that I came in, he said, for God's sakes, just give Joe Jennings a call. <laughs> so, and and um, Joe, Joe was a musical director at the time. For many years, yes. So he came in 1983 and stayed until about 2009. So um, he was a long time sort of guiding force for the artistic vision of Chanticleer. He, along with Lewis, the founder of Chanticleer. Yep. So um, basically straight out of college, I joined the circus and ran away and started traveling everywhere with everyone. So it was a bit of a learning curve because, you know, you can only learn so much in a university setting. And then there's the real life application of that knowledge and learning yeah. everything that you weren't taught. <laughs> but um, yeah. it was just such an incredible adventure and a chance to challenge myself to be around such amazing musicians and just artists. Um, mm. who really sort of inspired me to be much better than I was. Yeah. And, and pre-university, I mean, pre, pre, pre the voice, pre 14, did, did you sing as a, a boy soprano? Did you have any, any, any memories of singing pre your voice changing? My voice did not change. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so it, it started low as a child and then sort of just kept sliding down. There was no breaking, no, no awkward moments. It just, you know, at 10 years old, I would answer the phone and they would start treating me like my father. It's like, um, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the son, 10 years old. So it's just one of those strange things that happened. I don't know the physiology behind it, but it worked mm. very well for me. Yeah, and it, it worked very well for, for, for all those fans who have just yeah. adored your rich <laughs> bass voice. I, I, I used to call myself, when, when we were touring with the King Singers, I used to call myself a bass, except mm -hmm. when we were in California. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Actually, I, 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 I'm, I'm bigging that up. Actually, when I was in the States, whenever I was in the States, I was saying, well, I'm not a real bass. Of course, you know, you all know Eric <laughs> in Chanticleer. Um, yeah, I, I just have the bass part, but I'm not a real bass. Yeah, Eric, tell us a little bit about how Chanticleer got off the ground because it's it's every every group has a different kind of moment where something happens and yeah. and they fall into this kind of singing scene. What well, was the first and history? foremost, there was a group in England that was very inspiring to a lot of people around the world. <laughs> you might have heard of them, uh, something involving King's College. Um, um, yes, yes, you yes, you might know that. Um, so San Francisco at that time was a very fertile ground for a lot of arts groups. So within the San Francisco Bay Area, there were groups such as the Cronus Quartet, uh, mm -hmm. Philharmonie Brook, and Chanticleer that all started in 1978. So mm -hmm. something magical about that time. And Louis Botto, the man who sort of put everything together and motivated everyone to come together, had some secret weapons in his arsenal to lure singers into his dining room at the time or a friend's dining room. He was a fantastic cook and food being the currency of many artists. Um, he was able to sort of entice people to come and join this sort of experiment. Uh, he was studying musicology at a university locally in, in San Francisco area and studying this wealth of Renaissance music that had great, you know, great depth of, of artistry in it, but notice that most of the music was never performed by men and women together, especially the religious music, because men and women, of course, were separated for mm -hmm. liturgical settings. Um, so this great music was mostly performed by either men and boys or men and other people that they don't perform that surgical procedure with anymore. So he wanted to sort of find out what that sound was like, because we weren't hearing it at the time. So he called people in from the Grace Cathedral Choir of Men and Boys, uh, who sang yeah. countertenor, uh, friends of his from the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, and 
brought them into his, this living room and had them read through music. And that was sort of the, the seed that just kept growing. So first it was food, then it was, oh, this sounds pretty good. Then they thought, well, we should perform this music somewhere. And they did. And it just so happened that a local uh, artist management group was in the audience. And they said, this is really something. I think we can do something if you want to pursue this further. So they started touring around California, then around the United States. And we, we know where this ends up at some point. Mm. Well, I, I have wonderful memories of my early years um, with the King Singers touring in the States and, and, and coming into San Francisco to, to, do, uh, to do concerts there. And, and they were nerve-wracking events because we always had some, some real good ears and uh, critics in the audience, uh, um, you among, among them and, 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 <laughs> and, uh, and, and the rest of Shadi Clear. So th those, those, um, those concerts in, in San Francisco all had a real high fizz energy about them, uh, really brought on by, I think, our nervousness at having people who really knew Oh when, yeah, when things were out of tune and when things weren't balanced, so we had to tr try our best <laughs> to be as good as possible. Um, but actually, the, the the great time was after the concert where we would go back and have a party and have oh, yes. amazing food and mm -hmm. have fun and stay up far too late. Um, oh, I know that. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were great times, and um, you know, the, the the many concerts, many events, kind of pass under the bridge of a, of a long career. <clears throat> but um, but I, I always remember our culinary delights in San Francisco. Oh, it's a good eating town, yes. Now, I saw in a bio of yours that food features very heavily. In fact, <laughs> food and wine. And where does that come from? Is well, that part I, of your heritage? Or is it not part of your... Especially. Life? I grew up with, uh, you know, I'm of Mexican descent, um, sort of middle class. Uh, my parents did well, my mother cooked well, but um, never any fine dining. Um, but it sort of enticed me as a child, it's like, what is this that you know, people get mm. all fancy dressed up and go to a nice restaurant mm. with utensils that you don't know what they're for. And so it, it was in the back of my head. And then eventually traveling around, you sort of discovering different things from different places that you never knew existed. And that can be a great joy to discover. So all of a sudden, your breadth of knowledge expands. You find yourself being more adventurous and trying things. And then you start discovering the local joys. It's like, oh, there's a nice restaurant. So I'll save a few extra pennies and see if I can go there sometime. And it eventually evolved into me meeting one of my dearest friends, uh, a man named Ken Grant, who um, is my dining buddy. And he has enough discretionary income where he would invite me to several restaurants and we have dined together in San Francisco extensively um, Dublin haven't made it to London there yet um, Paris Brussels Vienna um, around he, he was living in London for a while so he would catch us in Europe um, and he likes to collect Michelin stars so I sacrifice myself as best I can to be good company <laughs> and aid in this and have <laughs> much broader dining experiences than I ever imagined I would growing up the way I did. I mean, that, that, that's, that's one of my, I think, you know, as well as singing in some of the, the great halls and cathedrals uh, in the world, it actually, it is, you're right on the doorstep, literally to, mm -hmm. you know, going to the far East, being in Europe to just try things that you would never um, be able to sort of try at home really, uh, you know, I used to love being in Japan. I, I oh, love uh, yes. uh, and just having Japanese breakfast every morning. That, 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 that real, real highlight for me. Um, every group, Eric, is, is, is different in the way it's run. Um, and every group thinks that they're pretty unique in the way they, they handle things. Most mm -hmm. groups have management that find the concerts and arrange the calendar for them. Um, Tell us a little bit about the structure of, of Chanticleer and, and uh, the, the kind of business, how things work. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the same now, but uh, how it evolved. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the beginning, of course, it was sort of the founder-driven sort of organization where 
of, you know, one or two people basically trying to do everything. And um, it, it grew from there. Um, so Lewis was definitely sort of the artistic visionary. Uh, eventually they hired someone to be sort of an administrative part of, of the organization as well. Uh, Joe came along and was with the music director who basically applied, you know, day-to-day -day knowledge and uh, running of, of the show um, in collaboration with Lewis who sort of had more visionary things. Um, and then eventually Lewis got sick and he passed away. And so there was sort of a big void and uh, there was a real separation. There was the administrative side taking care of the organization and the brand. And there was the artistic side that did sort of the musical, you know, show that we were doing. And those two are supposed to work together and, and make the whole process work. So we've had several incarnations of leadership over the years from founder, um, music league, it could be very collaborative. We've had times when it was sort of, you know, a superior dictating what was gonna happen musically and there was less collaboration. Um, there's been all sorts of things. Uh, Right now, it's an interesting time for Shanniker because they have new leadership, both administratively and uh, musically. So mm -hmm. Philip Wilder is now the new president general director and Tim Keeler is now the musical director. And the exciting thing uh, from my perspective is that they both come from the ensemble. So mm -hmm. Philip and I joined the same year, 1990. Um, he's been in and out of the group several times, went off uh, to have a really very successful arts administration career, um, in both New York and uh, DC and in San Francisco. Uh, Tim Keeler comes from the singing perspective and understands what it is to make the ensemble work. He was saying mm. countertenor, which is a very useful understanding for what the, the ensemble demands of their singers. <clears throat> I always joke that one of the things that makes Chanticleer exceptional is that we demand unreasonable things from our countertenors. And they do it. <laughs> mm. um, so uh, you don't normally find quite so many uh, counter tenors singing soprano you know, no. in that rate. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I was staggered when I first. I think I don't. I don't know how far I go back to Randy Wong. Oh yes. What kind of vintage was that? I'm uh, probably showing my age now. Just before I joined, so late eighties. Yeah. Um, um, and just just hearing. Yeah, of course we we had. Uh, Dave Hurley with this um, amazing mm -hmm. sub oh, sublime voice, voice and um, and and perhaps David more than more than anyone really had 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 this very very high voice but I I heard some of these um, some of these earliest recordings where gosh those guys were singing very high and you don't often hear that from yeah. from from the King Sings it's a much closer. Mm -hmm. uh, Closer, compact sound. The, the range is much um, uh, more limited. Um, yeah, I the, tell us a little bit about that sound because you know you, you are basically an, an, a, 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 a huge, a huge choir, uh, but, but but in in small numbers. I mean, yes. real high soprano stuff and mm -hmm. ultra low bass stuff. I mean. I, I don't even think even in my dreams I, I could ever sing as low as <laughs> y you were singing most of the time. Um, but it, it, such a range, and that, yeah. that defines the sound of the group. Um, it really did. And I think that's one of the things that I brought in my toolbox when I joined the ensemble is that having that lower extension available to the ensemble, you could adjust the, the, um, the pitch of, the, of a piece depending on the needs and not always sort of demand quite as much from the counter tenders that they needed to sort of have a little bit of a break. So that sort of opened things up on the bottom and, you know, flexibility. So have people mm. hopefully sing a bit more comfortably, but then of course we had some, you know, staggeringly talented counter tenders like Chris Fritchie who came in and sang for many, many years, but just had that upper extension again. Mm. So instead of just being able to shift things down, it actually just expanded things in both directions. Mm. So um, that's one of the things that I think really sort of put Chanticleer a little somewhat apart from, um, from other ensembles is just yeah. it could stretch a bit further. Plus having 12 voices, you know, it's larger than other yeah. groups around the yeah. time. And, so. and, and 
sartorially probably the most distinguished group around. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about this dress code, because it was well, very, very, very formal and, yes. and, and very smart and, and still is. Well, you know, we get all of our whites from London. <laughs> yes, uh, it's hard to find good PK and detachable collars uh, in yeah. the United States. So we, we go to the source. Um, I think I was just uh, looking for an image that stuck. And I think early on they thought, well, classical music one dresses appropriately and, mm -hmm. you know, a white tie and tails would be the, the appropriate dress for a concert. So they stuck with that. And, you know, in my early days, everyone went to sort of a used tuxedo shop and found what they could, you know, cobble together for some semblance of a, a, a white tie and tail look. Um, it was pretty ready. <laughs> we were yeah. all poor musicians at the time. And eventually, you know, it became more standardized. And now we have, yeah. Yeah. I keep saying we, they have um, a bit more standard uh, uniform for that. But it's mostly just especially in later years, I think they've been sort of focusing on what the brand look is. And mm -hmm. so for most people, they think of Chanticleer and they think of men in white tie and tails. So. Exactly. And, 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 and as the members may change, as, mm -hmm. as groups change, you know, groups that have been around for 40, 50 years, you know, that's, that's what happens. People come and go, but it's still the group, you know, um, yes. and they are instantly recognizable. Um, yeah. I, Tell, tell us a little bit about um, our, 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 our viewers that are going to be uh, watching, watching you sing this rather leading uh, role in, yes. in a Johnny Cash song, which is, is rather interesting. is rather interesting. I mean, for a start, it's incredibly low and a very low solo. And yes, basses aren't usually featured that much in ensembles like this. Um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Johnny Cash Ring of Fire. So let's see, it was probably about nearly 10 years ago. And one of the current members of the ensemble, Brian Hinman, um, had been advocating sort of getting a recording so we could feature some of the more um, unique and memorable voices that were in the ensemble at the time. And um, he didn't want that to sort of slip by without a, having a chance to show them. So uh, Casey Brevis was in the group, who's a fantastic um, singer of more popular music now. Um, he does a lot of 
YouTube things with his husband. Um, ben Jones was fantastic tenor. Uh, Brian has this sort of amazing extension on top. Um, there were other people, oh, Cortez, oh my, Mitchell, um, still in the ensemble, it's just, he has, he has lovely notes <laughs> and he has a lot of them. So having a chance to sort of break the ensemble apart and actually showcase some of the singers was something he really wanted to do. So eventually he got the green light to sort of pursue and you know, they started coming up with things. And um, they were looking for something that could sort of have me be more than a sort of like, you know, the featured bass, you know, string bass line under something. And as you mentioned, it, it's a bit difficult to find things that really sort of fit for a lower voice. But <laughs> Johnny Cash being Johnny Cash, the man in black, um, you know, he had his own lovely, dark, gravelly sound. And it was interesting. So they thought of this and asked uh, a good friend of ours in Ireland, Michael McGlynn, yep. if he'd be willing to do an arrangement, which normally he doesn't arrange popular music, but <clears throat> he's such a talented composer anyway. Um, he took it on. And so, you know, we were doing a conference call in, in someone's office and, with Michael in, in Dublin and going through, it's like, well, how do you want to approach this? And um, it was our interim music director at the time, Jay Switty, was thinking, well, you know, we could do it standard and a little guitar going along. <clears throat> but what if you try and take it a more melancholy way? So we started singing through and he was fiddling in the piano and Michael got inspired. So we thought, oh, well, let's try that. So eventually, you know, we got this arrangement and read through it and it's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, and uh, getting some of the backstory in the song too sort of helps, you know, mm. Johnny Cash was married <clears throat> and he basically left his wife for June Carter Cash and sort of all the, the stuff that comes, you know, with all of the, uh, the guilt and the, the joy of, of starting a new relationship like that. So it, it's, you know, I, I like what, what he did with that and the approach that he took. Yeah. And it, and it shows you off to your absolute fundamental, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my 15 seconds of glory in front of the young song. Yeah. Um, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing that um, w when we were corresponding, we, we, um, you, you, you told me a little bit like it, it, it feels being the bass of the group it feels a little bit like being a kind of a fine carburetor in yes. a, in a, <laughs> in a, in a, you know, not seen, but very, very important. And uh, I always try to say, say the same to, to people, you know, in ensembles when we've been d doing teaching or workshops, that sort of thing. Actually the, the bass and, and building sound on bass is, is very important. Um, yeah. And, 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 and we are the unsung heroes. <laughs> we are the rock upon which the cathedral is built. Yes. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, Didn't It Rain? This is, I, oh. I was listening to it today and it's a phenomenal arrangement. And uh, it, it's inspired me to want to go and listen to the rest of that album. Just yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Tell me, didn't it rain, children? Didn't it rain, oh my Lord? Didn't it all? Didn't it all? So we were very fortunate for many years to have Joseph Jennings as our music director. Um, he comes from a rich musical background. He grew up in Augusta, Georgia, in the AME Zion Church, black church on Sunday, lots of gospel, lots of everything. Grew up singing and playing piano. Um, then he went into college and got a degree in jazz and in conducting. So just sort of broadened his whole spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. When he came to the ensemble in 1983, he started arranging different uh, gospels for us. So I think we have two different gospel recordings in the Chanticleer canon right now. The first one was sort of more old school call and response, that kind of thing, um, which was fantastic. And a real, if you're serious about that type of music, it's a great sort of study for the different genre or different types of music within the genre. But then for this uh, later recording, he decided he was going to sort of do some modern gospel, um, sort of more contemporary sounds and harmonies and that sort of thing. And he called in his pastor, the now Bishop Yvette Flunder, to come in and sing with us. So Joe would teach us gospel the way he learned, by rote. 
There's no printed music. There's mm -hmm. you may get a word sheet, but that's about all. And so we'd go through, and he'd be banging away on the piano and doing everything. And he was an inspiring musician for this mm -hmm. kind of music. Mm -hmm. So we come in, and it's like, oh, this is fun. And then Yvette showed up. Oh my lord! I mean, <laughs> she's just a bright light, an amazing spirit. Um, and that woman can sing. Oh my lord! It's like going to church every day in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. So. I remember when it came time for the live concerts, we were out there and she knew how to basically run the whole show. And we would just sing and dance and, you know, jump around and do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you look at the audience, it wasn't a classical music concert. That was church for everyone out there too. Um, mm. They were, you know, waving their hands and hollering back and participating in everything. And it was probably one of the most exciting and, and most fun concerts that that i ever did it in with chanticleer mm. it mm. was just a, a joy yeah i mean that that arrangement is just is it's so energized isn't it it's so off the wall and yeah it's fantastic i mean it really is uh and it doesn't sound who, like 12 people singing or 13 with you that yeah it sounds no, like it's, a large choir which <clears> yeah. sort of shocked me the first time i heard that yeah no it's fantastic it's fantastic. Um, talk about recordings. Do you, yes. do you have favorite recordings that, you know, ones that from Chanticleer and from, from other groups, do you have kind of favorite things that you hold dear? Um, well, from other groups, there's my Desert Island recording, which is another fine group from England you might have heard of, the Hilliard Ensemble. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Their recording of Paratan is what I listen to when I need to be sort of healed. <laughs> it's yeah. just... Just simple, austere beauty. And mm -hmm. the way that man can form sort of this immensely long conscious firmus over minutes and minutes and minutes and shape mm -hmm. it. And it's, it's breathtaking. So that's, yeah, I'll, I'll say that first and foremost. That's my number one recording that I listen to. Um, Make a note, I, everybody. Make a note. Yeah. Um, it's, on, it's, on, it's not, we don't listen enough to Paratone. It's yeah. not, I don't think it's performed enough. Um, no. we, we don't have an idea how to approach this music yeah. because it's not in the, in the, 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 the usual genre. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. Um, but mostly I like listening to diversity music. It can be anything from flamenco to, you know, something Arabic or, you know, I remember the first time I heard Zap Mama was sort of like, you know, Afro-Belgian contemporary funky mm -hmm. fun stuff. Um, that's the joy is sort of listening and being surprised and, and learning new things. So with Chanticleer, it's a little harder because, you know, I was in the middle of all that. So it's yeah. very difficult to sort of step back and listen to the music when you're still thinking so hard about the, the performance. Yeah. 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 I, I, I look back at some of the albums <laughs> and we made in my time and that they, they, they become a favorite album in my memory yeah. because of the, uh, the process of making it, not yes. so much the finished product. In fact, mm -hmm. most of the time, and I'm sure you have this as well, that one doesn't even listen to the finished product because yeah. you're, you're kind of had so much of it and it comes out and it's in the cellophane. Yeah. And I've got still several albums still in the cellophane. Yeah. <laughs> but, I do um, too. <laughs> You know, I, I look back at, at some of the processes of um, making albums, which mm -hmm. which were life changing and yeah. and uh, educationally, you know, kind of defining moments. I remember wor working. In fact, actually, we did a concert um, of of that repertoire in San Francisco, but not with George, the great George Shearing. Mm -hmm. But we did a, an album called "Get Happy." with George Shearing just been as playing. Um, and just the whole idea of getting together with somebody who, who was learning uh, arrangements or reading them in Braille, reading cold charts in Braille, <laughs> and, and, and then getting together in a little cottage in the Cotswolds to, to, to try, and, try and find, you know, one voice mm -hmm. together, which was... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 end, the end album was kind of 
on on the risky side of our our our, our jazz yes. barometer, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but the, the, we learned a lot from from working with with him, oh, which yeah. was was fantastic. And actually, we did a concert with Richard Rodney Bennett in Davis Hall, I think it was. Okay, with featuring some of those things later on in San Francisco. Um, of, yeah, Richard Rodney Bennett arranged uh, a, a lot of stuff for the group for piano years back, um, which we then did on that album. Um, what about concert memories? Kind of the, 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 when you look back and think that was the concert. I, I remember for you know for different reasons, but that was oh, yeah. yeah. There's one from my first year that still is like you know the the one I tell people when they want. To, to have a big impact. Um, we had traveled to Estonia. This is summer of 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, Estonia at that point was technically still part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, that would change within about a month or two. Yeah. Um, so we arrived and there was sort of this electricity in the city. Everyone was just waiting for the moment when things would change. And you know, we were walking around the old town and of course we see this path going up a hill with giant boulders, you know, the size of, you know, a large truck precariously perched so that they would topple over. And that was to block the tanks from rushing parliament when they just wow. declared independence. And so it was sort of a, a, a strange electric feeling. And as we do, we went and did our, our musical preparations for everything. And as an encore, of course, we prepared something in the local language. So we learned this farewell song, you know, sort of nice way to sort of say goodnight at the end of a concert. Mm -hmm. And so for our first concert, it's the main concert hall in Tallinn. And we go there and sing a concert. Everyone's incredibly receptive. It's one of the, you know, the music festival where they have the 20,000 voice choir and 200,000 people in the audience. So mm -hmm. everyone's sort of geared up for music at that time. So we finally come to the end of the concert and we go out for our encore, we sing this song. And we just notice everyone's face sort of get glassy and sort of very austere. And then everyone stands up slowly and joins in the song. And you see people sort of getting teary eyed and all that. And we know something's happening, but we don't understand what it is. So we walk off stage and our handler was there with tears running down her eyes saying, how did you know? How did we know what? <laughs> it's like, then she informed us. This was not just a farewell song. This was sort of a resistance song and a song of farewell to people as uh, they're being shipped off to Siberia for being political distance. Wow. And it was really this rallying cry for the whole pe people. And so we were sort of shocked. And of course we had to go and do the same thing the next night with the same reaction. And there was no applause after that. Everyone sort of just filed up quietly and appreciatively, mm. but it was incredibly powerful. And so mm. you're reminded, it's like, yeah, sometimes what we do is just is pleasant and nice, but sometimes yeah. music has real power. And to sort mm. of be a part of that, you know, be a vessel through which that is channeled is, it can be life-changing. So that, that stuck with me for all these years. You know? Yeah, wow. And, and what a fantastic place to, to yeah. share your singing with the folk in Estonia. I mean, pr prior to, 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 to the breakup of the Soviet Union and to, to things opening up there, it was very kind of, pre, it was pretty insular, but had this has this amazing choral tradition um, yes. that we, we, we only got to know about really when, when things started to open up. But um, I remember several concerts there where the, the, the in, in, in the, in the main concert hall, uh, in town, and the the, uh, the atmosphere was just electric, um, and people were so excited because they they knew what good singing was, yes. they knew what good <laughs> choralizing was, and mm -hmm. we, we we always used to say unless people know what we're doing is difficult, they won't get it. <laughs> They've got to know mm -hmm. that it's quite difficult. It's uh, it's not just push, pushing a button and singing in tune. It's 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 quite difficult to do that and to make sounds together and to yeah. bend your your voice and stuff. But they they got it and um, some really exciting concerts oh, yes. in, in Estonia. Um, I I was just going to show you. I was it's only popped. I haven't thought about this. It's just popped into my head. If 
for the first time in a long time, it wasn't so much the concert that was the memorable thing, but I remember being in San Francisco for a concert, and I can't remember if it if it was at Davis Hall or the Herbs Herbs Might Theater. Have been Herbst yeah. theater. Um, it was one of the two, but it was the year the first Gulf War broke out. Nineteen ninety. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the the tension in San Francisco at the time, because when th when when things on the world stage break out, people in San Francisco come out into the street and kind of with their placards and, it, oh, and yes. protest. Oh, it's yes. the original protest town, isn't it? It is definitely one of the more left-leading places in the United States. Yeah. Um, and, and they're happy to sort of voice their opinions um, about all that. So, yeah, I, re I remember that. It's just popped into my head and just feeling, gosh, what's going on now? It was just a, a very tense time. Yes. Um, okay, funny moments. <laughs> Mo oh, moments few. on off stage where uh, I asked Johnny Howard this. I said, "What are yeah. funny moments?" And um, he he talked about um, unexpected expletive sounds from the the nether regions on stage, <laughs> um, but he didn't hold back in the language. And um, yeah. but I, funny moments I, on stage are, I have are two great musical ones. Um, one which was actually in Winnipeg, Canada, and the other one was in London. Um, Winnipeg, Canada, um, we had a tenor um, in the group, David Munderloh, fantastic tenor, great singer. He's still in Basel, Switzerland, singing right uh, nowadays. Um, and he was young, and uh, one of the tenors was indisposed, so he had to sort of step in to cover the beginning of a gospel arrangement that Joe had done, and it was call and response. And it starts off with a simple, Jesus, come by. And then the whole choir comes in, big chord here. Um, so David, not having done this in performance, thinks, okay, I can do this. So he starts, Jesus, come by. And he thinks, hey, I sound pretty good. I'm going to keep going. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and he gets lost. And so does the tonal center. And at some point he stops, perplexed, looking at the, at the ensemble. And we all just kind of come in. Here, <laughs> I don't know what it was that came out of our mouths, but it definitely wasn't anything in a chord. So there was, there was that moment. But one of my favorite moments was actually at our Wigmore Hall debut. And uh, a baritone in the ensemble um, had the beginning to one of the folk songs that uh, Shannon does. It's very famous, uh, an arrangement of Shenandoah. And so stuff so starts with the baritone solo going, Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. And the whole ensemble comes, you know, and the, you know, does what they do. Well, nerves got a hold of this baritone. And so he starts off, Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. And it's up about a sixth. <laughs> and so I, I just remember smiling leaning back, looking at the ensemble, thinking, well, I can go in falsetto, but let's see what everyone else wants to do. And they decided to take the key. So the counter tenors are, you know, eyes the, the size of saucers. And they go through, and at some point, there's a three-part canon with the counter tenors. First one starts, second one in direct imitation, the third one with the counter melody. Well, it's too high. They can't do the normal melody. <laughs> so on the spot, in concert, the first countertenor creates a new melody. And then the second countertenor does the direct imitation. And I'm thinking, wow, that's impressive. And I look at the third one, it's like, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> but they muddled through it, and somehow we got through it. And it's one of those things that will live in infamy. And also, as sort of a, you know, a shocking tribute to the musicality and musicianship of those people, that we could actually take such a horrible beginning and still make yeah. something of it. Was it the best art we ever created? No, no. but it was still <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I, I think. I think um, in my time in in the King Singers, I think we we were a particularly giggly group, mm -hmm. and we would get we would really get into trouble time, at times. Just mm -hmm. something happening, and and the old shoulders start to shake, oh. and. Um, oh. 
we we had um we had a piece um a, a premiere of a piece in F- Finlandia Hall by mm-hmm. Eric Berryman and um and it was a very intense piece um in Finnish um it was all the, the kind of old folklore Finnish folklore and the the, the fourth movement was a, a solo for me which was a very bizarre thing and when we in rehearsal I had to you know I had to weep over a grave and it was just all over the place of kind of but then we had a, um, a, a, a movement called nuku which apparently means sleep and for some reason this this little movement had some strange sounds that the middle guys in the group had to do a sort of <laughs> this kind of thing and and we would we would um we would end up sh- sh- giggling and shaking not giggling but just this guy <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and trying to sustain these long oh, yes. and i remember doing the, the a german premiere of this piece in a church i think it was in arpen and simon carrington was stood next to me mm-hmm. and he had to start the whole of this piece and i think we'd had such a giggly rehearsal he started <laughs> then he stopped and started shaking. <laughs> this was just a solo. <laughs> and he, and he, he looked up and said, I'm sure you go. I'm just going to start that again. <laughs> <laughs> and I know if he was here now, he would say, I have no memory of that, but it was yes. a, a fantastic moment. Um, <laughs> there was a, he, he, was, um, he was a real giggler, and mm-hmm. he would forget lines and make up things. We, we used to do a, a song called The Painless Dentist. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's da 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 Oh yeah, it's that tune, but with painless dentist words. And uh, the middle, the middle kind of, the kind of bridge, um, the B tune, the bridge tune, was a Simon Carrington solo. He goes, "I hum while you're bleeding," <laughs> he has it, which is the painless dentist. Yes. Um, and he came in a few bars too early and went. I hum. Sorry. <laughs> I hum. <laughs> Which just, you know, people thought this was rehearsed and planned, but it mm-hmm. was just those accidents. And of course, the rest of us are like this, and there's nowhere to hide when there's no, six of you. No. Uh, there's nowhere to hide. Um, oh. Eric, tell us a little bit about post Chanticleer. Tell us a little bit about Dorothy, Mia, Clara. Yes. Family life. It is, it's wonderful. Um, of course, in these days, a lot of wonderful can be a lot. Um, the world is strange at the moment with this whole pandemic issue. Um, we're, we're very fortunate in a lot of ways. Uh, my career has kind of dried up, as has most uh, singers' careers at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. So luckily, we weren't counting on that, and my wife, I married well and has a proper job and does well and is able to work from home quite easily, uh, having earned her degree in a PhD in virology. So uh, mm-hmm. her line of work is still busy, which is good. Um, yeah. And it seems that I've adopted a new career as a first grade teacher for my youngest, mm-hmm. which is something I never anticipated in my life. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm working with that. Actually, there is a proper distance learning schedule with the school. Uh, so we have that for both of the kids. But um, it's still strange. I, I, like many people, have lost a lot of connections from just being able to sort of run into someone casually, you know, at the store or a friend here, you know, for coffee or mm-hmm. you know, going out dining with my friend Ken, um, which, you know, we still keep in touch. But the, the simple things and sometimes more elaborate things are definitely wanting in, in my life. Uh, so yeah. that that's a bit of a challenge. Um, we're getting by. I'm following some musical things, uh, Chanticleer, of course, um, especially now mm. that they have the new leadership and they're doing new things and being very creative. 
um, in, in these times. Um, the, the whole Voltage 8 crew is also people that I know and, and like and follow. And so, um, you know, watch their whole Live from London broadcast yeah. that they did. And so, um, but in the meantime, I'm sort of trying to create my little nest here and make it comfortable and, you know, have the occasional distance visit in the backyard um, with yeah. one or two nearest and dearest people to, our, to us. Yeah. But it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge yeah. for, for me. We've, we've been so fortunate. Um, we've we had these, both have had these long careers at, at the, the, in the top of the archipelago tree and, and we've, we've toured the world and we've, we've some fantastic music and, yes. and, um, you know, I was, I was chatting with, with Johnny Howard from the King Singers, um, who's a longest serving member now and uh, just celebrated a, a decade with the group and just thinking about the new guys who have joined groups such as the King Singers and yes. um, who, you know, a few months in, in, into their new career, everything they've been working towards and we're in this, the whole business has turned upside down. You know, forgetting about the fin financial side, which is is, is 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 incredibly profound as well, because that's how we live. People suddenly forget that we 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 do earn, earn a living. Yes. It's not just a, a it is a love, and uh, we usually it's, get quite good at it. But it is it's our a vocation. Living. Yeah, it is. Um, but how how these young singers now? are finding the momentum to keep going, to keep rehearsing, you know, without an audience, how, you know, we, they can make recordings. Yes. They can do uh, live concerts to camera, but that kind of the lack of, of a live audience um, is, is something that we used to take for granted. Oh yes. Um, and sometimes too much so when you're in a in a busy, hectic, touring schedule. Um, here we are again, and gosh, it's the fourth concert in a row, and you know somebody's opening a noisy suite on the front mm -hmm. front row of a, a concert hall in Florida. You know, oh, yes. sorry, Florida, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was always Florida. Um, yes. And now the things we took for granted are, are not there, and it's it's a it's it's and and even from the position we are in now with with teaching and sort of guest appearances to to do when those things kind of dry up we we question kind of who we are don't we are Absolutely. at the basic level who am i you know and uh you know, I can walk into my study and, and, and see my Grammy and it's it like it looks like it belongs to somebody else, you know. Who what who is this guy? You know. Yeah. Leaving a group like Chanticleer mm -hmm. after three decades, one becomes a different finds the person. We almost find who we might have beaten if we hadn't tread yes. trod that path. Um and especially when, when all those, uh, you know, those lovely events we, we were getting, we become accustomed to, you know, the Acapella Festival in Leipzig where yes. we last saw each other. Um, those things hopefully will become, will, will, will happen again, but probably in, in a different, um, in a different way. way. Um, we shall see. Um, yeah. yeah. And finally, before you tell us what's going to happen next week in the US, <laughs> let's That's let's time date this. <laughs> so I know. We, we're, we're counting down in the UK to to yes to next to, Tuesday to America. Yes, hopefully doing the thing. Um, once again, I'm in San Francisco Bay Area, which is a bit more left leaning than some other places, um, and I'm quite happily living here. So I will say, I know a lot of my friends are preparing for disappointment, but hoping for real change. So it's been 
I mean, talk about adding to the bizarre times right now. Um, the political landscape right now is just so polarized and people just can't find any middle ground and mm -hmm. it's all about tearing the other person down. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll find the change that we need. I hope um, that democracy, both with a small and a large D, will prevail and yeah. uh, that um, we can start fixing some of the things that basically have been damaged or taken apart over the past, not just four years, but several years. Um, if, if there's a way to find common ground between essentially warring sides of the country, <laughs> um, at least politically, um, that would be a great start and something we can build on. But mm. like all things, there's never a magic pill that fixes everything and it's gonna be a long process to make any sort of improvement. So mm. I hope the, I hope the change begins on Tuesday. Yeah, well, having, having spent months months and months out of my life touring in the states um you know places where people don't go you know right from fairbanks alaska down to the tip of mm -hmm. florida everywhere in between I, I i don't ever remember it feeling like it is now and i i hope it um i hope there's a better way somehow yeah, that's a better but, way. Uh, anyway we we keep our fingers crossed and uh, try not to be too political yeah. um eric thanks and thanks so much for spending so, a, a lot of your day it's a pleasure being able to speak with you again it's been far too long and i hope it's not too long before we have this chance again either on camera or off yeah <laughs> well th thanks so much and and we will be in touch again May hopefully not 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 via zoom it would be lovely. I, I have my plans with my friend Ken to come to London sometimes. He tells me there are lovely places to eat, and I intend to discover that with him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank, thanks so much. Love, love to the family. And also to you. Be well. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>